So we just made a start at the end last week at looking at the work of Matisse. I just laid a bit of the background in looking at some of his very early works or how he studied with the painter Moreau, a symbolist artist. Uh, but he also, in a work like this, uh, discovered Impressionism. This is really still Matisse in the latter part of the 19th century. We're actually just at the cusp, the turning point now where we're starting to look at the work of the 20th century, having focused on post-impressionist artists whose breakthrough moments were in the mid-1880s, you could say. Uh, we're now focusing at another on another moment where a lot of things happened, the first decade of the 20th century. In fact, I will show you the work of Matisse through his whole, whole career, going through into the, uh, just into the second half of the 20th century. But a particular interest is the moments in the very beginning of the 20th century where Matisse and other fauve artists had their breakthrough. Fauvism is a movement he's associated with, and that's associated with a fairly small time period, you know, 1904, 1905, 1906. Uh, Fauvism is only uh, around as a kind of distinct phenomenon for a few years, although the individual artists go on and do their, their own thing after that. But Matisse is head and shoulders more important than any of the other artists associated with uh, Fauvism. Um, and uh, then the second movement we'll be looking at in this part of the course, the second half, is Cubism, uh, creation of Picasso and Braque. Um, you could say that the years of Cubism is 1907 to 1914, something like that. Between those years, there's a partnership between the two artists uh, that breaks up in 1914 with the outbreak of the First World War when Braque, as a French citizen, is called up to, to, to fight. And um, Picasso, as a Spaniard, is not. But anyway, their close style of the creative cubism ends at that time. So that's a kind of focal time we're concerned with. But just looking first at Matisse, we'll follow him through his whole career. So the dinner table, Impressionist influence, very different from what he was doing even a year earlier that is much more tonal in its conception. Also, you know, studying from the old masters in the Louvre, he's an artist with a sense of um, art history uh, to him. Already before the century has turned, he's concerned with using brighter color. Here's uh, an example, the Corsican landscape of 1898. I think that it's kind of important to note that Batiste's engagement with with bright non-naturalistic color starts quite early you know it doesn't start the same time as the engagement with bright color happens for most of the other fauve artists he's a, he's a fauve before he's a fauve there's a sort of pre-fauve color phase in his work he made a visit to the island of corsica the mediterranean island of corsica uh, in 1898 and to the south of France. So this is a work from that uh, trip. So probably an outdoor work or at least started out the doors if, and even if it's finished in the studio, a small scale work, very spontaneous. I think something of the influence of Van Gogh has come in. You know, there's very strong continuity between the work of those color inspired post-impressionist Van Gogh and Gauguin and the work of the Fauves, Matisse uh, 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 at the center of them. Uh, he actually bought a, um, a drawing by uh, Van Gogh uh, about a year before he made this painting. So there's a, a, some evidence of a specific dialogue with Van Gogh in this sort of brighter color, quite spontaneous style. There's another source at work. At the, here's a second example of the very colorful work produced by Matisse, 
before even the end of the 19th century. Um, the first orange still live. Um, yeah, very bright, non naturalistic colors here as well. But the little kind of dot like application of paint here perhaps gives us the clue that he's also been looking at neo impressionism, the style, um, pointed as the style of Seurat, uh, which was so, so influential on many artists of that, of that generation. You know, Matisse was born at the end of the 1860s, so by the end of the, the century, he's, he's already in his 30s. He's not that young, but he's, he's an artist who takes quite a long time in his development uh, to, before he finds his own signature style. You know, sometimes that's often, you know, quite often that's that can be the case with an artist who comes to some, you know, great individual style. Uh, we can think of uh, more recent artists like uh, Pollock or Rothko. They take quite a long time before they find their own breakthrough through style. Nowadays, if you're a, a student of art in an art school, you better have some kind of individual style in time for your graduation show, you know, because what else are you going to get marked on if you can't come up with something uh, original or pseudo original, you know, but actually it's pretty difficult by that age of 21, 22 to have found your voice as, as an artist. Uh, some people may be so lucky that they can, but you know, those things work at their own pace, you know, you, 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 you can't, it, it's counterproductive really to try and force it. Um, sometimes it, it, it's just better if you take a bit more time and, and let your own voice come through, you know, over time. Certainly it seems to have worked for Matisse to, to, to take that more gentle uh, approach to things. He's, um, it's not just that he's slow at finding his way, he's, he's got a certain sort of cautiousness that means um, he doesn't even just keep going forward, he also seems to sort of have phases when he's, if not going back, at least consolidating. So after producing those works which are really very colourful, uh, you get a work like this. Uh, the standing nude or the male model, 1900, right at the turn of the century, which is a lot less colourful uh, than what has preceded it. So we associate Matisse as an artist, he uses bright, non-naturalistic colours, but he doesn't just sort of, as soon as he discovers the possibility of using such colours, he doesn't just then latch on to it for good. He actually takes a step back. And I think it's something to do with his strength as an artist that he uh, you know takes that slightly more cautious uh, approach to things i think we can see pretty clearly what has happened what has happened is that he has discovered cezanne now uh, all of the four artists eventually discover cezanne the discovery of cezanne is a very important thing for many artists at the beginning of the 20th century um, and a lot of them discover it after 1906, you know, because that's the year Cezanne died. And uh, because he died that year, there was a retrospective exhibition of his work at that time. And so a lot of artists dis dis discovered Cezanne at that point. Um, that was the year that Picasso discovered Cezanne. That's why Cubism starts around 1907, because it's the impetus of Cezanne is so central to Cubism. But let's note then that Matisse has already discovered Cezanne uh, six years earlier than that. Um, when other faux artists discover Cezanne, it, it, it almost comes as a shock to them and, and Cezanne's concern with form and structure, composition, uh, comes as, as a sort of challenge to their more spontaneous 
expressive, full of language, and and in some cases sort of kills it off. You could say that's the case with Brack, who starts off as a folk artist, but then becomes one of the co-founders of Cubism. He gives up on the, the bright color, the expressivity, and goes a different route. So Cezanne challenges him to give up what he's been doing. Various other folk artists, like Derain, the same thing happens. Basically, he ends his folk phase when he really comes to terms with Cezanne. Uh, you could say the same with Lamanck, you know, his art changes pretty much in the same way. But Matisse doesn't go through such a crisis at the same point because he's already absorbed lessons from Cézanne. He's already interested in structure and form as well as uh, colour when he comes to his fauve phase. It's all with this knowledge of Cézanne behind him already that is already dis displayed in works like this. It's a study from a model. It's a kind of student work, the sort of thing you do in an art school. You study from a, a nude model. That it's not a the subject. It's not about something. It's about studying the model. So it's because he's willing to take that student's attitude for uh, a longer period of time that he's willing to. He's able to kind of have this really strong foundation. On the one hand, an interest in colour uh, and expressivity. On the other hand, an interest in um, form and structure from Cézanne. And his work is to put the two together somehow. And I think that's what gives him a, a greater longevity as an artist using colour than some of the other folds. For some of the others, uh, Fauvism is like a kind of young man style, a kind of ex excess of youth, you know, a sort of uh, um, extremism of uh, expressivity. But Matisse is coming from some more centered place and able to, 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 to do more with color as a result. So a kind of retrenching is what I'm seeing in a work like this. And it's common. It happens at other phases of his career as well. Retrenching before going further again, consolidating before going further again with Carla. Uh, so this more intellectual side of him, more considered side of him. I think you can see what I'm saying when I say there's something, Suzanne, you know, the, the, the structuring of the figure in terms of planes, patches of pigment that's very much something from Cezanne. He's thinking very much about the structure of the the, 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 the figure's body, reducing it to s simplified forms the way Cezanne often did. And a certain kind of angularity, block-like quality. He had bought this painting by Cezanne, the three bathers by Cezanne in 18... 99, so just a, a year or so before that painting of the, the, the male model. Bought it from uh, Vollard's art gallery, perhaps with the encouragement of the impressionist painter Pizarro. It would have been something of a financial sacrifice at the time, you know, he wasn't a successful artist at that stage. So it must have meant a lot to him. He said about it that it had sustained me spiritually in the critical moments of my career as an artist. I've drawn from it my faith and my perseverance. Matisse and Pizarro had had something of a, a dialogue. Pizarro was quite a helpful artist towards younger artists coming along. We already know that from um, his help towards... Cézanne and Gauguin. And Pizarro told Matisse, uh, in relation to this theme of the bather, that Cézanne was not an impressionist since he always painted the same picture. Matisse uh, expressed this to himself as being in these words. He says, a Cézanne is a moment of the artist, while a Sisley is a moment of nature. Sisley uh, is the impressionist painter that Pizarro regarded as the sort of typical impressionist. 
there is some color, but the color is more just to, to model rather than to um, re relying on tonality um, to model. And that's something you could get from, from Cezanne. After he left the studio of Moreau, after Moreau's death, he stayed in uh, another artist stu studio, that of Eugene Carrière. So literally, he continued being a student for a long time. Carrière, we saw one of his works as a comparison slide when we were looking at Surat towards the very end, compa compared Carrière's monochrome uh, symbolist style with the drawing style of Surat. This was a particular Italian model called Bevilacqua that Matisse makes several studies of. Um, and indeed, he comes back to work from the same model in a similar pose in a sculpture. The Surf, 19, oh, 1900 to 1903. So here's another dimension of Matisse as an artist, the fact that he's also a sculptor. He's primarily a painter, but he's also a sculptor. And I think this is actually one of the interesting characteristics of 20th century sculpture, that a lot of the interesting things that have been produced in, uh, at least in early 20th century sculpture, is sculpture made by artists who were also painters, rather than purely sort of specialist sculptors. Picasso, of course, is another major example of this as a painter who will, from time to time, go into sculpture. Like Matisse, he's not making sculpture every day, but uh, occasionally he will go into sculpture. Uh, it becomes a, a sort of way, perhaps, of escaping from impasses, blockages, creative blockages in your um, primary activity. Uh, you can go into another medium to try and solve it. Or maybe, you know, when you become very famous for doing something, it's, you get a sort of stage fright phenomenon where, you know, the spotlight is always on you. What are you going to do next? Are you going to be able to uh, take things to another level? Okay, so you can juggle with five balls. Can you juggle with six? Can you juggle with seven? You know, it becomes a higher expectation all the time. So maybe to get uh, into a different medium where people have no expectations of you, you're not known as a sculptor, gives you a certain freedom to do, do interesting things. Even in the 19th century, you see this with Degas. Um, his explorations of sculpture are some of the most um, innovative uh, explorations with the sculpture in the 19th century, perhaps just because he didn't have a sculpture or training in the conventional sense. Um, Matisse, he wanted, I think, to study with Rodin, the most famous sculptor in France of, uh, of that whole period. Uh, he didn't succeed in doing so. He ended up working with Baudel, who, who was also a very famous sculptor of that time. Originally, this sculptural piece had arms, apparently, but then that they come to disappear. The surface is very worked. You're, you know, it's working. Um, it's you know, the piece is modelled rather than carved, modelled and then cast. So the original model piece is worked very much by the artist's hands, and therefore it catches the the, the light. Or you, you also have some sense of the the surface as uh, uh, as as molded by human hands, perhaps the same way as you would if you see individual brush strokes uh, in a in a painting. You're aware that it's made by by hand. This is his first original sculpture, you know, standalone sculpture. There's something Matisse said, which I think could perhaps be related to this work. Um, although he, he is actually a statement from 1908. In 1908, he made several statements about his art because that was the time when he was doing um, some teaching. So when you, when you start to teach, you have to kind of clarify your thoughts about things. 
Uh, and so there are quite a lot of things by Matisse from that time. What interests me most, he says, is neither still life, life nor landscape, but the human figure. It is that which best permits me to express my almost religious awe towards life. I do not insist upon all the details of the face, on, on setting down one to one with anatomical exactitude. If I have an Italian model, this is what he has here, who at first appearance suggests nothing but a purely animal existence, I nevertheless discover his essential qualities. I penetrate amidst the lines of the face to those which suggest the deep gravity which persists in every human being. A work of art must carry within itself complete significance and, and impose that upon the beholder even before he recognizes the subject matter. Um, I suppose he's saying something about well, it's got to work at the level just of forms. You've got to, you, even before you know what the subject matter is, you've got to be have a sense of power from the 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 work itself. I, I can compare it with a, a Matisse sculpture. Uh, uh, sorry, a, a Rodin sculpture. Uh, the the Walking Man of Rodin, similar figure without arms. So you could say that's the sort of influence of, Mat of a Rodin onto Matisse. He becomes a rather different kind of sculptor to Rodin, in fact. I will, I'll say more about that later. Now Rodin would sort of s explain a sculpture like this, the saying, well, you don't need a head, you don't need arms, because it's a sculpture about walking, you don't walk on your head, you walk on your feet, so, you know, eliminating what's inessential. That, that f concern for the fragment is a big thing in uh, Rodin's sculpture. Yeah, and even in this painting, Carmelina, 1903, it's named from the, the model, mm -hmm. Again, it has a sense of being a sort of student work. It's not uh, a study in an artist's, um, you know, in a in a classroom setting, a life class. It's in an artist's studio. There's a little kind of self-referential self-portrait in a mirror behind. Um, it's again sort of self-consciously art about the making of art. You know, you could make a study of a model to pose a certain figure in a narrative painting, but you, but that's different from revealing that the model is a model. It's a sort of laying bare of the process of art. But here, it's pretty much just sort of local color. There isn't that kind of bright uh, color, even much of the kind of impressionist interest in, um, you know, the fall of light on bringing alive all different surfaces and the color in them. So again I see it as part of this sort of consolidation phase for Matisse that lays a kind of ground, on a solid ground from which he can then build the next story of his structure if you want to use that metaphor. And here, here would be that next story. It, it, it's still a work where you see quite strongly influence of other artists. It's not um, really a, a purely individual style, far from it really, but still uh, you could if you like say this is the first important individual work that Matisse has produced. Lux Calme e Volupte, 1904 to 5. Um, the title um, comes uh, from a poem by great French poet um, Baudelaire. So you could translate it into English as luxury, peace, and pleasure, something like that. Uh, but we leave the title often in French because it's a sort of quotation, not the title of the poem, but a line from the poem. The, the poem is called The Invitation to the Voyage. 
one of the poems from the Fleur de Mal, the Fleur de Mal, the Flowers of Evil collection by Baudelaire. Uh, I'll just read you a little bit from, from the poem. My child, my sister, think of the rapture of living together there, of loving at will, of loving till death in the land that is like you. The misty sunlight of those cloudy skies has for my spirit the charm so mysterious of your treacherous eyes shining brightly through their tears. There all is order and beauty, luxury, peace and pleasure. So that's that, that kind of last line which comes back three times in um, the, the course of the poem as a, as a sort of almost like a chorus in a song. There all is order and beauty, luxury, peace and pleasure. That's just one English translation of it. Matisse had spent the summer of 1904 in Saint-Tropez on the French um, Mediterranean coast with Signac, the follower of Seurat, the most important follower and proselytizer of Seurat's style. So it's not surprising if we see uh, some renewal of Matisse's interest in uh, the style of Seurat at that time, working side by side with Signac. Remember, we, we just saw in the, the first Orange Still Life that there was some interest in the style of, 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 of Seurat there. So it's already in his mind, it's not something new, but he's now coming back and, and having a more coherent look at what Seurat has to offer him as an artist and takes on in a comprehensive way uh, Seurat's style. It's actually painted after he returns to Paris but after studies made on the spot. So responding to the heat and light of the south of France, the Mediterranean uh, feel if you like. It's a little drawing, one of the sketches he made. You already see. This is a little note to himself. Again, these are the kind of drawings that are, would not be expected to be presented to an audience. It's not for our pleasure, it's for his understanding. So it, you know, he, he's not trying to produce a, a finished work of art. Just making notes to himself. This is the kind of Seurat painting I, I want to compare it to because it's, uh, it's an early work by Seurat, of course, the, er the earliest major painting, as we know. Uh, so he hasn't really used his mature style, but you know the, the, the diagonal of the bank and the little kind of cut in the bank and the figure's very uh, static. I think that's, there's something of that that comes back here the diagonal and the sort of cut in it, the mixture between figures with clothes on and uh, you know, bathing or finished bathing, even the presence of a boat, um, are some of the same ingredients as the Seurat painting. That mixture of Clothed and unclothed figures also reminds me of Manet's Déjeuner Solaire, the luncheon by Luncheon on the Grass by Manet. Mm, another scene with a picnic. Here's a Signac painting from the south of France. Um, just to say a lot of his Matisse's um, engagement with Seurat comes mediated by Signac and his um, take on what Seurat's doing. Um, this actually is not one of the works that were painted at the same time as Matisse painted his Lux Carme Volupte. It was actually painted a few years earlier, 1896, in, but in Saint-Tropez, the same 
location that they spent time together with uh, in, in, in 1904, summer of 1904, Saint Tropez de Pinewood. One slight difference between Signac and Seurat is Signac will often use more of this sort of white, a white color. Um, Whereas Seurat was an artist who, who's primarily concerned with modern life. Uh, arguably one of the real reasons for his technique is to bring modern life into a greater clarity, greater focus than the, the blurring of Impressionism uh, allows. Impressionism treating everything as a, what, uh, just another subject that light can fall on, blurring boundaries between things. But Surah brings things into sharper focus, therefore a more critical social gaze can come in. But that's uh, not quite the same as Signac's focus. He will often, because it's a painting from life, a, a study of the south of France, but he also produces works that are more utopian, sort of idyllic scenes of uh, figures in, 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 in nature which are closer to what Matisse shows in the Lux Carme Volupte. And another artist who's also employing uh, the, the legacy of Seurat at this time, another neo-impressionist artist, was also with them in the south of France, and that is Cross, C-R-O-S-S. -S. Uh, he also produces these sort of uh, utopian scenes of of harmony. The suggestion is that those kind of utop that kind of imagery, the iconography of, of, of utopian harmony, uh, in the case of Cross and other neo impressionists, may be influenced by anarchist thought. It may be uh, a sort of political utopia, a vision of a time uh, beyond uh, when everyone is a, a wage slave and looking to a kind of time of of harmony that could come, a, a vision of a possible social future. I think that's less something we can pin down in Matisse's case, but uh, the fact is he's taking up the same kind of imagery as uh, they have adopted, and as well as that, as more obviously so, uh, the same style. It's clearly neo-impressionism that's influenced him, Seurat's pointless technique. But at the same time, I think it's important to say he, he's never quite using it in a, a kind of pure way. Um, for instance, he's, he is mixing the colors on the palette before he adds them together in, in the painting. Now, the idea of Seurat's technique is by putting, you can put pure unmixed colors on the painting surface and then they mix in the eye at the appropriate viewing distance and therefore there's a greater luminosity. But if you're going to mix your colors on the palette already, uh, then you, you're sort of losing some of the, the value of that technique. Also, I don't know if you can find an appropriate viewing distance from which to view this Matisse painting at which these dots really would blur together in the eye. Actually, you could say that's even a problem with, with Seurat it himself, but definitely so in this case. The, the individual dots are then therefore not a purely a, some sort of technical means for producing greater luminosity. They become a stylistic mannerism in its own right. I've, I've raised that idea when talking about Seurat, that the same thing may be true of Seurat's painting, that uh, um, a technique becomes a style, but definitely so here, I would say. Uh, uh, so something that is a sort of technical necessity for producing greater luminosity becomes a stylistic, or even you might want to say a decorative uh, characteristic of the painting. I, th I can think of parts of the painting where he deliberately is not blurring the colors together, but, but making them stand out one against the other. You know, the 
red outline around the back of this figure, for instance, your, your blue outlining here. You, you, things don't really, well, you know, just anyway, quite different colors put side by side at different points where they, they stand out as separate colors rather than harmoniously blurring together at a certain distance. He's exploiting color contrast. I mean, for aesthetic effect, it's not like a mistake or something that he's made. He's doing this for a certain aesthetic es effect, uh, rather than blending colors. The overall effect is much more decorative than um, um, uh, uh, a Seurat painting. The dots are, are larger, more distinct, further apart. It's more abstracted. Well, nevertheless, despite these sort of differences from Seurat, there's enough of Seurat in it that it actually pleased Signac, and he bought this painting after it was exhibited in the Autumn Salon uh, in 1905. I think he sort of saw Matisse as a, uh, a promising young convert to Neo-Impressionism to carry the style forward into the next generation. But uh, that's not exactly how it worked out. Um, Matisse has gained something a lot actually from Seurat in the liberation of his colour but it's, it's a sort of misuse, a creative misuse of Seurat for Matisse's own purpose. And he isn't going to go on with this style, having learnt from it, having gained a certain kind of liberation through it, through taking, taking it on, like putting on a, a piece of clothing for a while. Uh, it's given a sort of liberation, but then he will, will, will move beyond it pretty quickly. And uh, This is almost like the last... Uh, influence that he needs to adopt before he can really have an independent idiom of his own. One other artist I should have mentioned as a, a source is Puivy de Chavin. Now, the, the, indeed, this Puivy painting, the Dupe or the Gentle Lands, um, this is a work that I could have equally have shown you when we were looking at that Seurat painting. It's an influence, I think, already there. Pleasant Land from 1882 by Privy, Privy de Chavin. You know, it has that kind of cut in the, the diagonal bank and then the cut in it. It has the, um, the sense of calm, sort of utopian feel. Even the little boat is there that's in the Matisse painting. It's a little bit similar. Clothed and unclothed figures. I don't want to push it too far, but I think <coughs> Puivy is definitely an artist that many are looking to. We saw Degas looking at him, Seurat looked at him, um, visited his studio, uh, Matisse uh, admires him, Picasso admires him as well. So quite important. An academic artist who nevertheless is picked up by the more avant-garde artists. We shouldn't see those two worlds as completely distinct. So the next thing we see from Matisse 1905 is full-blown fauve style of the artist. Fauve, uh, meaning wild animal, uh, was just a disparaging label given to the works of these artists that, that were seen in a particular uh, autumn salon exhibition. Uh, the critic didn't like them, so he said that uh, um, You know, they were like a, a circle of wild beasts uh, surrounding a, a figurative sculpture that was in the room. Same with cubism, it's a kind of disparaging term that was later becomes adopted and used, rather than the term given by artists them, them, themselves. Futurism would be a term given by the artists themselves, for instance.
the open window, Collier, 1905. So Collier is another town on the French Mediterranean coast, further along towards Spain. He was there <coughs> that summer with Dera, who becomes another of the important figures of Fauvism, D-E-R-A-I-N, Dera. I, I think it, it, is in, it is worthwhile to remember that artists develop these styles in some kind of dialogue. You know, they, 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 there's a conversation going on with other artists, and especially if you're working in the same place at the same time, uh, you know, you, you're inspiring each other perhaps what you can talk about at the end of the day or even having your easel side by side in certain situations perhaps. So two good friends and, and Matisse being slightly older than the other four artists. Well, I think color is the first thing you want to talk about when you see an image like this, a certain kind of freshness of color, arbitrary or non-naturalistic color, some quite pure colors, but also some pastel colors, meaning colors mixed in with white. Some of the purer colors are more towards the center of the image and some of the more pastel colors are more towards the edges. The colors we see are not naturalistic but nevertheless it's still I think a painting that is orientated towards the real world. He's using bright colors but to create a sense of the heat and light of the south of France. It's still in that sense a work that's within the tradition of Impressionism and it's concerned with conveying atmosphere. Some complementary colors brought together if we want to think about the color composition, you know, greens and reds, oranges and blues, you know, there's, there's compositional structuring going on. Um, composition in terms of the brushwork, the brushwork at the central part of the image is more broken, bro broken touch and then more joined together, smoothed together, blended together, brush strokes towards the edges. You might say it's a, a slightly hybrid style. You might even want to see uh, the way the balcony area is treated as showing vestiges of his dialogue with post-impressionism. Uh, sorry, with neo-impressionism, the style of Seurat. So he's not using the same kind of touch everywhere in the painting. He doesn't feel the need to, to do so. Compositionally, the more active, visually active accents are towards the, the center of the image and a slightly calmer quality, although it's all very fresh um, elsewhere towards the edges. We're so aware of the technique, We're so aware of the forms, not just of what they represent. You know, it's, I think it's pretty fair to say when you look at an image like this, you're as much aware of, sh of the shapes and colors as you are of a balcony or boats in a harbor. And it's hard sometimes to quite work out how much attention we're supposed to pay to one or to the other. Are we meant to, to, to think of it just in ter as, a, as a composition of colors and shapes? Or are we meant to see through it to, to the subject matter? I think we are meant to see the subject matter, but um, I think the, the, the style or the formal dimension is also part of what the image is about. It's a sort of second subject, if you like, that may even becomes the, the first subject. It's all very uh, flat. Is that there's actually a sort of deep space, a view of an interior and an exterior. Uh, 
yet the Matisse has brought that, that deep space forward onto the flat surface of the painting to make a, uh, a two-dimensional design. It's, it works as a two-dimensional design. We don't have a sort of sense of an illusionistic hole through to another world, despite the framing window quality of it, which might suggest that. Open windows, views through windows, is something we, we see fairly often, or views through windows or doors, something we see fairly often in a Matisse painting. A lot of white. I'm saying he's mixing white in with colours to make this sort of pastel quality. But there's also the white of the the bare canvas. Well, I say bare canvas, but the canvas would have been prepared with a, a, a sort of a white surface first. But there is that white that before he actually starts working on this particular scene, then there's the white added on top of it or mixed in. A lot of this mixing would have been done on the painting surface, not on the palette. You know, he's mixing wet in wet in the actual painting itself. Probably here as well. So a very spontaneous way of working. You know, put one colour down and see how that looks, put another next to it. If that's not quite right, you add another. You, you're, you're building harmony, thinking relationally, one colour against the other, paint against paint. Quite thin, uh, thinly applied paint in a sense. Many, many areas. Allowing the, the touches space to breathe by letting the white of the ground show through at different points. About this theme of the open window, someone once in a interview in 1942 asked him about this, where does the charm of your paintings of open windows come from? And um, Matisse replies, probably from the fact that for me the space is one unity from the horizon right to the interior of my workroom. And that the boat which is going past, he must be thinking of this painting because he's talking about boats, the boat which is going past exists in the same space as the familiar objects around me and the wall with the window does not create two different worlds. Well, someone went and took a photo in the very hotel room that Matisse uh, was in. I mean, these things are actually not that informative, I suppose. But uh, anyway, they, there you go. Another early Fauve painting, a kind of iconic Fauve image. From Woman with Hat, 1904 to 1905. He's already looked, as we know, at Surat. He's already looked at Van Gogh. He's also looking at, Mati uh, at, at Gauguin. Um, no doubt he was already aware of Gauguin, but he did also have some particular opportunity to visit a collection of Gauguin's uh, Tahitian paintings uh, whilst he was at Collioure in the south of France, a collection owned by someone called Daniel Montfried, who was a, a friend of the uh, sculptor Mayo. That's the connection. Um, Gauguin is the one who explores the more decorative side of colour, so that's something that comes out later in Matisse too. Van Gogh, the more expressive side perhaps. You can see some works where one comes more to the fore, some works where another comes more to the fore. Maybe we should take our break there, then we come back and, and, and look at this work after the break. <laughs>